Chairman, I confirm we're now live. Thank you very much. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, members, um, those at home uh, and those here in the chamber, welcome to this edition of the Overview and Scrutiny on the 7th of April. Um, and we would like to say thank you to the Council at the beginning of this um, because they've done a fantastic job on this IT here to everyone that's at home. It, it's absolutely amazing. So we hope it's all going to work, but at the moment it seems to work very well. So uh, a, a great thank you to them. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, to, to Mark um, Granville, who um, actually usually sits with us, but he's, um, he's, he's uh, resigned from the commission. Um, but anyway, I'd like to thank him for all his work and his help uh, during those, um, those times. So what we're going to do is do the usual. Um, it, it's, it's a bit novel because we haven't actually done this in the, in, in the chamber for two years. So it's, uh, it's a great journey to come back to. So we're going to go through the normal way. So um, uh, Jen, who's on my right here, um, and she's going to help me through this. So uh, any apologies, uh, Jen? So, Chair, we've received apologies from Councillor Mrs. Matic, Councillor Kirk, and Councillor Neil are the apologies that I'm aware of. And um, councillors who are with us in the room, obviously I can see you and I would just like to um, take attendance for councillors who are joining us remotely. So if you could please turn on your microphone only and state that you are present when I call your name and anyone who um, doesn't state that they're present will be marked as um, apologies. So, Councillor Mrs. Birch. Present. Councillor Angel. Councillor uh, Mrs. Mackenzie Boyle. Present. Councillor McLean. Present. Councillor Mossum. And Councillor Temperton. Thank you, and I can see we have a number of, we have some other councillors who are also on the call, if you could just confirm that you're on. Um, that's Councillor Birch. Present. Uh, Councillor Lizzie Gibson. Present. Councillor Bidwell. Present. Councillor Hayden. Present. Councillor Ingham. Present. Thank you, councillors. Thanks, Jen, very much. Um, I should just say that I'm councillor Tony Virgo, um, and I'm the deputy standing in for councillor Angel, who unfortunately um, is indisposed with COVID. So we all wish him well, actually. Um, okay, going on um, with the report. So we've got the minutes of the last meeting, item two, um, and I'm just going to call the pages out. If anyone wants to raise anything, please do. Um, so it's pages five on your sheets, six, seven, and eight. So I take it the members are content. Thank you very much. And then, of course, we come to our usual declaration uh, anyone, please, any member that would want to declare anything at this point for the declarations? Well, I take that a no, so thank you. Um, urgent items of business, Jen. Uh, we haven't received any, none that I'm aware of, Chair. Very good. Uh, and public participation? Again, there's nothing under that item, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we go straight on with the business of tonight, um, and we're delighted to, um, to introduce uh, uh, something that we've wanted here in this area for a long, long time, and that's a new hospital. Um, and so I'm very pleased uh, that we're gonna be joined by Carol Deans, who I understand is the Director of Communication at Frimley Park and also Dan Bradbury, who's, uh, who's the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer uh, for Frimley Park. So welcome to both of you. 
Um, and I, I, just before you start, Dan, if you're going to start, first of all, so welcome. Um, myself and uh, Councillor Gibson and uh, Councillor Temperton uh, were very lucky to see Round, um, you know, invited to come and have a look at this facility. And I know some people have already actually start, had uh, appointments there, but um, I'm just absolutely flabbergasted. I think it's an absolutely unbelievably brilliant facility. Um, and I'm so pleased it's here um, so to our residents. So um, with, with that ado, and I know it's not the normal hospital, so that's the sort of thing to say, isn't it, really? But I leave it to you, gentlemen and lady. So I'll hand it over. Thank you. And, and Carol's going to share her screen, but Chair, for the record, can I, can I just... Um, I'm Dan Bradbury. I'm the Chief Operating Officer. Um, my, my first world colleague is laughing at me for being promoted. But, I've upgraded um, you I, I already. Think, I think <laughs> I, I, at the risk of getting myself into trouble with my boss, I think it's probably fair <laughs> that we record I apologise. Um, so I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Frimley Health um, Foundation Trust. Um, so what we're aiming to do this evening is to give you an overview of the hospital, what it does, what it looks like. Um, and what some of the service changes around Heatherwood and particularly the Bracknell area are going to look like. And then I suspect we'll, we'll probably take some questions if that would be OK. But I think it's probably worth us um, giving you that opportunity first to set the scene. Um, I see there's a question already and I don't, I don't know whether we yeah, can Yeah, let's, let's do what you said, Dan. So you, you give us a set the scene, then we'll take your questions. OK, fantastic. So, Carol, yeah. um, are you, are you happy to yeah, you have I, to drive your slide? I, I have shared them, but they're not showing up, so I'm not sure whether it's because I've, of I've me. I've got them on my screen, so if that's a measure metric. Can colleagues, because I can see the TV screen in the chamber, and I can see that colleagues can't see the presentation, so we can s We can see it on our screens here in the chamber. Um, Fine, good. So, um, so let's, if, Carol, do you want to just drop through and I'll, I'll begin the narrative, but I think that's probably the fairest way to do it. And I'll, I'll just pause as we move through. So, so first can, of all, it's probably excuse, just worth... Excuse me, can I, can I ask Carol to please turn her camera off? I do apologise, this is new to us. Uh, just if I could ask whoever's speaking to be the only one with their camera on, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. OK, so first of all, it's probably just worth... Um, paying tribute to the last hundred years of, of what's been going through Heatherwood. Um, a, a, astute historians will remember that it was built as a um, hospital for tuberculosis for children. Um, it had a significant number of beds and quite amusingly a school. It had a church. We used to keep people in there for over a year. But it's quite important to remember that what it was originally designed for has shaped the way the hospital has been used and how we interact with it. So, we'll, and we'll come on to some of that in a moment. So, Carol, if you can flick forward one more, please. Um, so, we use the current Heatherwood for the wide range of services. And about 15 years ago, the urgent care centre that was located in Heatherwood was moved to Brant's Bridge, which is where the Out of Hours Walk-In Centre now runs. Um, and it was run purely as a, as a planned care facility, so not for emergencies. So, we ran the, a wide range of outpatients, We've got an MRI scanner, a CT scanner, X-ray, endoscopy facilities and six operating theatres, which concentrated on day surgery, but did some overnights. And I, I talked about the shaping the environment. But for example, if you were going in for an orthopaedic operation, the way the estate was designed was that we would wheel you from the ward on a trolley along a concrete walkway, which had an overhead covering, but nothing protecting you from the elements from the sides. And so we were forever putting um, patients in overhead cover, covering them in space blankets. And despite all of that, patients absolutely loved it. Um, it had a hugely loyal following. Um, the feedback was amazing. It was a good hospital. And when we came to writing the business case a few years ago, we were trying to work out how would we measure the patient metrics? And we realised that the level of patient satisfaction at the Old Heatherwood was over 98%. So as a, as a, as a measure to improve upon, that was going to take some beating. But it's probably worth highlighting, therefore, that because of the way the hospital was originally designed, it wasn't really set up for efficient and modern care. So you could really start to see, particularly in the operating theatres, where the estate was starting to crumble. And that meant we were starting to have some issues with a small number of cancellations where parts of the estate were starting to let us down. So we definitely needed to modernise the estate. If we just flip one, Carol, please. 
Um, so we, we talked about that, but the aim of building the new hospital was that we built some efficiency in from the outset. So we, we could produce the greatest number of services at high volume in a really modern environment that patients loved. Um, and at the end, I think we'll probably get the opportunity to talk about what the feedback has been after the first couple of weeks of it, of it running. But just as importantly, we wanted to build it in a way that was environmentally sustainable and that worked for our patients and our staff, but also allowed us to use modern building design to try and control some of the costs that might, have, might otherwise have crept in. And we wanted to make a big thing of opening the building as well, which um, clearly COVID and the last few, few months have, have made slightly more challenging. If we just go to the next one. So our ambition was one of the best planned care facilities in the NHS. And, and we, we went out widely to look at who else was running services in this way and tried to make sure that what we were doing reflected not only the best of what they were doing, but we then tried to exceed that. Our aim is to deliver our planned care more efficiently in a much better environment in a way that suits our patients' needs. And um, Chair, you referred to the fact that you've been waiting for this some time, but we really wanted this to be a beacon hospital that, that reflected our ambitions as an organisation so that people, and I've, I've already started to attract phone calls from people saying, well, we want to build something like this. Can we come and find out how you did it, what you did? So I think we're already starting to tick some of those boxes about being a beacon. Um, I talked about the modern design and we've just got some photos and we'll show you a bit more in, inside, but from left to right, you can see looking down on the entrance atrium with the DSU waiting room on the mezzanine, one of the modern operating theatres. So every single one of the operating theatres has got what's called laminar flow, which is basically an overpressure of air, which means that no infection can get into the patient or onto the bed because the overpressure stops it moving. The, on the right is the main outpatient's atrium. And on the bottom is an example of one of the patient's single rooms. So we really have tried to design this in a modern way that reflects our needs. Um, we also wanted to build in as much modern technology as possible. And we'll give you a couple of examples as, as we go through, but also focused on patient well-being. So if you look out, we can most of the outpatient room, sort of the inpatient rooms, face out onto the woods. Um, one of the things we're proud of is the water balancing pond now seems to attract deer which come and drink and even go swimming in hot weather. Um, so it's an absolutely fantastic environment with which to interact. Um, I talked about it being designed for efficiency. So we want to care for NHS patients, but also to provide a facility for private work, which helps then to fund some of the services we may not otherwise be able to, to provide and gives us facilities for our staff. So it's really important we got the map. The, the balance right. We've built six state-of-the-art laminar flow operating theatres and on top of that we've got two smaller procedure rooms. So a procedure room, a good example, is where you might do some work that looks surgical under local anaesthetic but doesn't require a full operating theatre. And one of those we've devote, dedicated to lithotripsy, which is effectively shockwave treatment for kidney stones. So we're, we're trying to build on that work because we know there's growing need. There are 38 inpatient beds, of which 18 are single. And then on the top, you can see a photograph here of our day case pods. So each of these has a sliding door that comes across and it allows patients who are about to go to theatre or are coming back from theatre can effectively have their own room rather than being on a ward. And that's a fantastic experience for the patient, but it also means we have control over any, any potential risks to infection control. So it allows us to minimise the risks to our patients. On the ground floor, I talked about the large number of outpatient procedure and treatment rooms and 24 outpatient rooms is a small, slightly fewer than we had in the old hospital, but they're much closer together, better organised and I think we'll get better use out of them as well. But it's important to factor in we don't quite have the full capacity and we'll talk later about how we've moved services around to, to mitigate that. We've also doubled the number of endoscopy rooms, um, and in part that's due to the rising number of cancer cases and our ability to scope patients and help make sure we diagnose treatments quickly. And then we've built in MRI, tissue injuries and mammography as well for screening. As part of the build, we've also constructed a new primary hair, um, care hub, which isn't part of the hospital, but is on the same site. And on top of the NHS facility, we've got a small number of private patient facilities with, again, their own consulting rooms, a procedure room and 10 beds. So we've really built this both for growth, but also to give us the best environment in which to care for our patients. 
Um, so what are we going to be providing out of the out of the um, facility? Um, first of all, to talk about procedures, we're going to focus on lithotripsy, on plastic surgery, particularly skin conditions um, and soft tissue, ophthalmology, particularly cataracts. Um, we're going to diagnose hysteroscopy and cystoscopy for screening, but primarily it's going to be an orthopaedic operating facility on the operating theatre floor. And that's in part to reflect the huge need of, of our patients. Um, Orthopaedics has the highest component of our waiting list, and we wanted to give ourselves the best opportunity to deal with that as quickly as we could. On top of that, we've got diagnostic facilities, and I've talked about endoscopy, but also a large number of cardiology testing facilities, radiology, which I've talked about. And then in terms of outpatients, the primary areas we're going to look at are gynaecology, medicine, ophthalmology, oral surgery and ENT. Um, so we've built specialist chairs for um, small procedure work orthodontics, I've talked about orthopaedic outpatients, there'll be a purpose-built physiotherapy gym, clearly people will still be able to come, need to have their blood taken, so there's a phlebotomy service there, I've talked about private patients, and then there's going to be a urology um, um, component to this as well, and we'll come on some of the, how that's going to make a big difference in a moment. In terms of the layout then, it's built into the side of the hill, so you enter on level one, but level zero is endoscopy, scoping and all of the services and facilities. Level one is the main outpatient floor with the consulting rooms, the private patient facility for outpatients, all of radiology, max fax, and the blood collections as well. The second floor is the theatres, and then on the top floor we have the inpatient wing which has its own dedicated therapies and occupational facilities as well to allow patients to recover as quickly as possible. And then on the fourth floor is our plant room on the roof. Um, and we've tried to design it so it's got environmentally friendly facilities, but it, it's been built so that all of those facilities are well out of sight of the patients and those attending. So what does this give us? So first of all, this completely elective facility means we can keep operating all year round. And, and you will have seen in the press, hospitals which are under pressure often have to give up some of their elective work where there are high numbers of A&E attendances and admissions, particularly the last couple of years where COVID has been a factor. So this facility will be completely what we call green. It will not have um, acute admissions in it, and it's designed purely to help us tackle our waiting list. Um, I've talked about the operating theatres, but they are designed to be absolutely state of the art so we can give the best care, one stop treatment and do things quickly. So give, allow us to see the right specialist as quickly as possible. So just one example that we'll perhaps talk about in a bit is the way we've designed the urology corridor allows us to do a one visit um, diagnosis for prostate cancer. Whereas previously patients may have come back two or three times before they had that diagnosis. So it allows us to treat and diagnose a lot faster. That plan care facility that we talked about should allow us to tackle our backlog. Um, and like every NHS trust in the country, the last two years have not been kind to patients who are waiting as a consequence of the interruptions due, um, due to COVID. And we want to give ourselves the best opportunity to treat those patients. We're also converting as many procedures as we can to day cases. So we did our first day case hip replacement in the new facility on Friday last week. And it gives you an example of how innovative you can be if you've got a facility that's designed to do that. And we've talked about the speed at which we want to treat and see patients for, for their routine procedures. And um, as well as it being uh, fantastic for patients, we've also designed it to be environmentally friendly as well. We were one of the first trusts in the country to set out an ambition to reach net zero carbon. And we've built a sustainable building. So it's got a living roof. It has a pond, I talked about the bond, balancing pond that's built into the woodland, the solar panels, and then we're also integrating it with public transport, with buses coming onto the new site, disabled parking. We've given ourselves the maximum parking we can within the constraints of the site, and we've also started to build in electric vehicle charging points as well. So we've tried to make this great for patients, but great for the environment as well. Um, the geography, so if I can just orientate you to the map, the, the top end of the shaded area is the old hospital. Um, and as you follow the map down on the left hand side, you can see where the new building is with the two new bus stops, the hospital site and the new GP hub is just off the access road, 
next to our new administration facility in the Greenwood offices in, in the old mental health facility there. And that facility has existed for five or six years now and is a cracking place for us to run our, our admin support. And the existing site is then going to be converted to a residential development over the next two to three years. Um, in terms of travel facilities and access, I won't labour the point, but we've, we've talked about bus stops, car shelters, uh, sorry, cycle shelters. Um, we've been looking at the car park over this week and we think the highest it's reached is about 70% occupancy, the public car park. Um, and that's also in part because we're on a we're building up how quickly and how much work we do in the building. And we think we've probably got the numbers about right once we reach full capacity. But again, it's got the ability to reach this through public walking, cycling and um, through patients own vehicles. I talked about the new GP hub, so the two practices have merged into the new facility that opened last June. And again, what we're now starting to look for is opportunities to collaborate with um, our primary care partners and to work out how we can better improve the interrelationship, particularly about management of long term conditions. So if one thinks about cardiology, respiratory and how we can get the right advice and guidance in and out of our um, primary care partners, which should speed things up for them, but might mean that patients can, don't need to wait ages on a pathway if we can get the right advice to them as quickly as possible. We opened the doors on last, well, last Monday, Monday the 28th of March. We took over the building in December and there's a it's a normal to a three month commissioning process that allowed us to do that. The week before we opened, we had a week where there was no activity and we moved over some of the theatre equipment, um, for example, anaesthetic machines. We moved in all the new furniture and in June, our new electronic patient record will also be live in the building, which will seamlessly join up all of the ends of the trust which currently runs off two separate computer systems and uh, we're really looking forward to that because that thing will be the final cherry on top in terms of this development but we are, we're really proud actually of everything our staff have done and our relationship with Kia the construction firm to get this project delivered absolutely bang on in the middle of a huge pandemic which could clearly have had large implications for, the, for our timeline so we've been really impressed at how everybody has pulled together to make this happen. Um, we also need to look ahead. Um, we, we reviewed what was going into the um, Heatherwood about a year ago because we had to manage the impact of COVID on our waiting lists, but also the need to keep elective activity in a completely COVID secure environment. And orthopaedics is one of those services that can be really badly affected by um, acute admissions and high infection rates. And you can imagine the importance of keeping joints that you're sealing free, free from infection. So we wanted to maximise that opportunity. We also looked at our waiting lists and our elective recovery ambitions, and we wanted to make sure that we had the ability to treat the highest patient waiting lists in this new facility, rather than them potentially being affected by our acute sites. And we took the opportunity during that review to consolidate some services. We also have to reflect the fact that, as well as the COVID pressures, Winter seems to have an impact on many NHS trusts um, and we're not immune to the impacts of winter. So where there are large numbers of admissions through the accident and emergency, it also means that we can continue to operate on the Heatherwood site without being affected by that. And that review has also reflected in our ambition to focus on orthopaedics and ophthalmology, reflects the fact that these are two services in across the whole country with very large waiting lists, which have real lifestyle um, implications for our patients. So we wanted to make sure that we gave due weight to that in the operations in the theatre. So we wanted to mix the services or balance around to give ourselves the best opportunity to recover the post COVID weights, but also to do that in an environment which maximised all the benefits we've given ourselves in, in Heatherwood. And, and Carol's just going to talk about how some of that will play out in practice now. So if I can, Carol, am I OK to hand over to you at this point? Uh, no, I think this one's mine, isn't it? So over the next 12 months, we're intending to increase ophthalmology, specifically cataracts. Um, I've talked about the one stop pathways for, for cancer, and we're aiming to increase the amount of lithotripsy that takes place on the Heatherwood site and create a centre of excellence there. In addition, we've created gynaecology ambulatory pathways on top of the gynaecology screening, and we've moved planned orthopaedic surgery, about 80 percent of it, from Frimley Park to Heatherwood joining the considerable amount of work that was already done there as part of being part of Wexham Park. 
And we've also had to move services out of Heatherwood Hospital, a small number, to enable those improvements and enhancements to our services. So if we just bring the next one up. So I'll, I'll switch off at this point. Thanks, Dan. So, um, so I guess my job um, with all of this has been to try and really look and understand what the impact um, of maximising the benefit of Heatherwood is going to be for our population, for our patients, and and try try to uh, see what that means for different areas of our population as well. So, um, so I've done quite a lot of work with Dan on this, um, but it's really really hard to be exact about the numbers. So I've given you in the briefing pack that went out to members before the meeting, I've given you a sort of flavour of the numbers, but but these are some of the reasons why it's hard to be precise. So, so working with COVID for the last two years um, has really transformed the way all of us work. I mean, you, you said it yourself, Chair, at the beginning of this meeting. This is the first time you've been back in the chamber um, as, a, as a committee uh, since COVID. And so we've all got used to this digital technology, um, virtual appointments, uh, Teams calls, whatever it might be. Um, the other thing that we've been doing a lot more of, um, and this is a national initiative, but we've been working on more and more, is what we're called um, patient initiated follow up. So traditionally, uh, when someone has uh, an appointment, they automatically have another appointment, they might have their operation, and then they will automatically have a series of appointments spaced out over whatever time frame it is relevant to that procedure. But with a lot of things, and particularly with long term conditions, um, a lot of patients tell us that they, they, they come for the appointment because we've given them the appointment, but they don't actually need it. And what they'd much rather do is be in a position to have access to their specialist as and when they need it, rather than just because they've got an appointment. So that's something that we've been working quite hard on, on introducing and doing more and more of that sort of work. Um, we have got a short term impact at the moment where because of the limited face to face appointments in some areas over the last couple of years, we are in some cases seeing more people face to face than we normally would. But just for short focus bits of, um, of, of checking, really, I guess, to make sure that everything's OK. Um, so 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 some of our numbers are up because we've done that and that's not something that we would carry on needing to do. Dan mentioned the uh, the introduction of sort of one stop shop type pathways. And as we start to introduce more and more of those, people will be changing from having, you know, maybe three, four, five appointments to get from an initial referral to various tests and a diagnosis and then their treatment and follow up to, you know, having a whole load of that just in one visit and then just one follow up and maybe only a patient initiated follow up. So they may not even have that follow up if they don't feel they need it. So, so that changes the number of appointments that we're seeing. And we're doing a lot of work with um, a national um, initiative called Get It Right First Time. So this is a huge national initiative around really benchmarking um, all hospitals in particular different specialties or procedures and really looking at how can we make things as efficient as possible for for the, the, the way we the way we work. So all of those things in the round significantly change the potential numbers from what we saw last year, what we saw two years ago, to what we might see in the future. So so I've been trying to be mindful of that when I when I look at various uh, figures and an impact for people. Um, so just to give you a flavour, I guess, of what this means. So for for Bracknell Forest residents, to be honest, most of it is, is just it's just more more stuff on their doorstep and and better stuff on their doorstep. So Dan mentioned about ophthalmology, so that's completely new to the area. Uh, the lithotripsy um, that that Dan mentioned again, that's 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 new and at Heatherwood. Mammography that wasn't at Heatherwood before, so that's come in. Um, I can't remember whether Dan mentioned that we've doubled the size of endoscopy, uh, but we have. Um, so we've gone from one complete suite to two, which means that if we wanted, we could um, have a, 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 a list of, of female patients running at the same time as male patients, or we can just have double the, double the quantity coming through. Um, I know Dan mentioned about the gynaecology 
uh, work that's going on. And so we've increased that and again, been able to, uh, with the new Heatherwood, really centralise all of that, that service. So again, we can get that one stop um, pathway going on for patients and urology that, that Dan mentioned. So all of those are, are services that, that are either expansion or new or just running better for, for your, your local residents. Um, and then there's some pathway changes. So obviously, if we're going to um, centralise and, and create these sort of centres of excellence around things like orthopaedics and urology, um, we have had to make some space in some cases to allow us to do that. So some of the some of the, the, the I guess the tweaks around the edges, because that's 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 how it feels to me. But but I recognise that for every patient that has to do something different, there is a there is a potential impact for them. So so I wouldn't want to ever uh, sort of diminish that that impact on the individual um, there. So orthopaedics, uh, the routine elective work that has been done at Frimley Park will now be done at Heatherwood. So I know some Bracknell Forest uh, residents would have travelled to Frimley Park. So so they'll now be able to um, to go to their local very local hospital. Um, that was around 200 patients um, over the last 10 months or so um, that, that that would have been applying to. However, by moving this to Heatherwood, we're really, really hopeful and, and actually incredibly confident that we'll be able to see more people. So, um, so those waiting lists will start to come down for people um, and make a real difference. So um, I'm hoping that people will really start to, to, to notice that one. Um, so general surgery, um, in the old Heatherwood, we did bits and pieces of various other procedures um, in the theatres. And what we're planning to do is obviously by, cent by centralising the orthopaedics and the ophthalmology, um, the way to make that work as, as well as we, we need it to, um, is to not try and then fit in little bits and pieces of other pieces of surgery. I'm sure the surgeons would be horrified to hear me describing it like that but but that's that's what we've needed to do so so those bits of alternative surgery if you like um will now be consolidated back into Wexham Park and Frimley Park rather than trying to do a little bit of everything we are doing that specialization um so so kind of linking to that then is the outpatients that goes with that general surgery um that will again be be incorporated into the various other places that people can go for outpatients but but outpatient appointments are available in a wide range of community settings as well as Brimley Park and Wexham Park so um, so that will be available in all the other places that it currently is. Uh, with medical outpatient appointments we are going to be doing less of those but we will focus those on the local residents so as a rough estimate we think that probably about 30 percent of uh, Bracknell Forest appointments will continue to be at Heatherwood um, and the rest will be available in all of the other locations but again this is another one where it's really really tricky because there's a lot of reasons why people choose to go where they do um, sometimes it's it's about being the nearest hospital or the nearest clinic um, for others it's about um, when they can get an appointment so um, some might might travel further to be seen sooner and, and others won't. So that whole patient choice is something that we've been really mindful of with all of the arrangements that we've made. And that's why we are keeping alternative places for everything that we're that we're um, offering. Um, and then paediatrics. So um, paediatric outpatients is still currently at Heatherwood. Um, and what we're planning to do is move it to Bracknell. So um, from Ascot resident points of view, they're coming two, two miles towards you. Um, and and we're, we're looking to put that into Brantsbridge. And I've got a slight uh, mistake on my slide there because I've said subject to planning application at Brantsbridge. And if you can forgive me, I need to just bring Dan briefly back in um, because I need him to just uh, correct uh, what I've put there because it's not Brantsbridge that there's planning application for. No, it's a planning application for um, a temporary modular unit at Skimpid Hill. Um, so we would move it there. And the reason for that is that at the moment, our maternity community hubs are spread over three locations in Bracknell. There's one that keeps moving in terms of uh, peripatetic, 
there are three clinics that run out of Brant's Bridge and three that run out of Skimpid Hill and keeping them all together to give us both economies of scale, but more importantly for staff validation, testing, and, and they are ideally supposed to run as a unit, it means we need to move that to Skimpid Hill. And that's why we are seeking your support in trying to help us with a letter of comfort over allowing us to do that. And, and those who live local will probably remember there used to be a, a modular unit outside Skimpid Hill. And we would expect that to be there for about three years until we've confirmed whether we're moving into the Lexicon One development. Um, that then frees up space at Brant's Bridge, which into which we would move paediatrics. So the faster we can um, agree that as a way forward, the faster we can move paediatrics to Bracknell. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Dan. Um, okay, so just looking at engagement. So, so clearly getting the views of the people that are using the service is absolutely at the core of what we want to do. So I've already met with all of the local health watch, including the health watch covering Bracknell Forest, and talked to them about the best way of, um, of getting patient feedback, being mindful of, of the fact that we're still we're still dealing with COVID. We still don't really know what the impact's going to be um, longer term and, and what the needs are going to be. So what we're proposing is to review everything in 12 months time so that we can at that point have hopefully a much better idea of well, what the needs will be in all of our hospitals around COVID, um, but also what the impact of all of this has been on our waiting lists. Um, so where we're prioritising what we are at the moment, things may may change um, in a year's time. So what we've agreed with the Local Health Watch is that we would do a period of engagement with our patients and their relatives over the next 12 months um, and do that as an ongoing thing. So not wait 12 months and then get views, but actually get views throughout the next 12 months um, where there are things that, that people make suggestions of things that would make things easier or better. We'll look at how we can introduce those straight away. Again, not waiting 12 months before we do anything. Um, but then what we want to do is do a really full review at the end of that 12 months uh, so that we can then use all of that information to uh, to decide what the, the longer term changes might be, what things need to stay, what things need to change some more. Um, and and really get that get that um, that that longer term view. But at the moment, we're just not in the right place. Um, we've still got oh gosh, it's over 200 patients um, in our hospitals at the moment with COVID positive. Um, now, albeit they uh, there are a lot of them, the majority of them are there for other reasons, and they happen to have COVID. Um, but it still affects the way we have to um, deal with them in the hospital in terms of the you know, the PPE that we have to use, the spacing, the distancing, the way that they're nursed and cared for. So so still still very much in the thick of the impact of, of COVID. Um, Car Carol, could I, could I, I'm sorry to I break into you, but I, I'm just wondering whether we should just open it up a bit with some questions and we can go back um, to anything else that you think you you haven't um, you haven't uh, said. But do you mind if we do that? So uh, so it gives the members yeah, that, a chance to, to grill really, you <laughs> really timely because actually that was the last slide that i've just okay. put up there now right so it was more that that discussion about how we work with you now what you want from us and how we work together so um so that'd be great so shall i take my slides off of the sharing and i know you only want one person on the screen at a time but would it be uh appropriate to have both dan and myself so that we can answer questions between us i would have thought so i would have thought so Please. Okay. Um, shall I just start? I'll start off, and then uh, I hand it to some of the members. Um, the first thing I was going to ask, really, I suppose to Dan, actually, um, we're all a bit concerned um, with staff shortages, uh, Dan, and you know this is obviously a nationwide thing. I wonder how Friendly Park was coping with that, and um, what's the future of that, please? So uh, I think it's important to remember that as a as in a trust, we, we run three hospitals. We run Frimley Park, Wexham Park, and Headwood Hospital. And we move staff flexibly where we need to as part of that. So um, there are some services which are national challenges. So theatre staff, particularly um, scrub staff, um, anaesthetists, and radiographers are, are three particular trades. Um, 
where, where there are staff who are challenged. Now, first of all, we're seen as a, a good trust and a good place to work out in a, in a good part of the country. So the, the very geography has an attractor. The new building has been an attractor and we are making our way up. We've increased the establishment of the workforce, not just at uh, Heatherwood, but also at Wexham Park. And we're actively recruiting. And in the meantime, we're, we're making up to make sure that all of our theatres can run by using our usual mechanisms at this time of year. So um, staff may volunteer to do an extra shift every couple of weeks. That, that's fairly standard, particularly post winter when people are trying to recover waiting lists. Um, it's also worth noting that there are two theatres in Frimley Park Hospital, which are currently undergoing refurbishment. And again, that's allowed us to free up the staff from those theatres to work flexibly across across all of the sites. So at the moment, we've been able to staff with the couple of exceptions across all of three of our sites where the surgeon or the anaesthetist catches COVID on the day. And I don't think you can really legislate for that. Thank you very much. Um... You know, we 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 sympathise with all this to keep this thing going. Um, Michael, did you want to ask a question? Um, I think it's probably good if you announce who you are, so we know at home. Then. Okay, the cam the microphone is on. Um, good evening. Thank you very much for the the excellent presentation and also the PowerPoint, which I we've been through previously. And I have to say, a lot of work went into that. Um, it's really it's a, it's, it's a question that I asked, which is to do with an operational consideration. Um, I noticed that there's no provision for minor injuries. Is that a decision that was taken that will allow those people who have got cut fingers or broken arms or whatever to go instead to Frimley, to Bransbridge or to Royal Berkshire Hospital? Um, and also, following on from that, will the website make it clear uh, that minor injuries, i.e. A&E, is not at Heatherwood as it was in the past. I just wonder how that can be communicated to the public to save unnecessary journeys. We, we will have to check the website. It's important to remember that um, the minor injuries unit hasn't run out of Heatherwood for some time and, and all of the signage around, around the site reflects that, the road signs. It says hospital, no A&E. It's, it's really clear about that. Um, there is a minor injuries unit at France Bridge in Bracknell and again that's reflected in sort of urgent care centre signage on, on the roads and on the local websites. Um, we don't as an organisation run that, but it's one of the um, one of the sites that runs within our within our patch, so to speak. Um, it's probably worth differentiating between the immediacy of the urgent care, which I think is the question you're asking, sir, about um, how how patients see help in an emergency versus our ability once they might have been treated initially to then patch them up afterwards where we would be able to be referred, patients would be able to be referred in by a GP. So if, for example, they required a skin graft or those sorts of things, those are the sorts of things or proper deep stitching after an emergency patch job's been done. Those are the sorts of things we can do in a procedure room at, at Heatherwood. But again, they would be following a GP referral or something after they've been treated as an urgent patient. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much. Can I just bring in uh, Councillor Tina McKenzie-Boyle, please? Tina. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Can I, uh, sorry, can I just ask, um, um, are the guests to turn their cameras off? Otherwise, um, people at watching from home won't be able to see Councillor Mc Mrs. Mackenzie Bull. Thank you. Well, possibly that might be um, an added advantage, frankly. Um, can I just say, that's a very, very good um, presentation. For the last year, I've had personal experience between Wexham, Heatherwood and Frimley and St Luke's in Guildford for obvious reasons which I'm sure you chaps will understand but why don't the IT systems and it's about time they did talk to each other so shall I come shall I come in and answer yes please <laughs> so, go. Um, so so yeah no um uh, it, it's a really really fair point and it's one of the things that Dan alluded to at the very beginning of his presentation so um, historically, our, our IT systems, um, we have over 200 different IT systems just within Frimley Health, not to mention the ones that are run by uh, GPs and, um, and the mental health service. So um, we are coming right to the end of um, a really exciting time, actually. We, we will next month, no, 
where are we? No, June, sorry, two months time, we will be launching our new electronic patient record system, which will then join all of those systems into one system for us. It will also um, offer portal from GP practices to our hospital systems, and it will also have a, a, a My Primly Health record for patients so that they will be able to see access to various bits of their own records. They'll in some cases be able to contact uh, their specialist or their consultant, um, get access to information, possibly videos later on, not, not straight away, but um, the, the, the potential is there. So it's it's actually because of the um, the systems themselves. So we've we've um, yeah, 200 systems into one takes quite a bit of um, quite a bit of work. Um, and and I think it's um, I'm trying to think how much it is. It's 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 266. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, a lot. And and and, you know, a multi million pound um, piece of work to to fund it as well. So so it's it's a, a huge bit. Um, it's been something that's been uh, a real challenge for all of us, actually, because when we try to be one organisation and um, one NHS, one Primary Health, and yet we can't talk to each other on the systems. It, it is a challenge. Um, the, the, the team are really good at working around it as best they can. Um, but yeah, come, come the middle of June, we will have the one system. That is absolutely brilliant. And I'm sure a lot of people who've been in my position will be very, 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 very happy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tina. Thank you very much. Um, Michael Gabbidwo, please, uh, is coming on. Uh, Thank you, uh, Councillor Michael Badable here. Uh, just wanted to say before I ask my question, thank you very much for providing us with such a wonderful facility. Uh, it's well overdue. Uh, my question first of you've built a state-of-the-art fa uh, facility. Will you be providing free Wi-Fi across the hospital? The simple answer is yes. Wonderful. Um, as part of our preparation for that electronic patient record, what we've done with all of our sites is we're com uh, completely refurbishing all of the Wi-Fi in all three hospitals. But Heatherwood started with it right from the start. So we've got really strong, reliable Wi-Fi um, with free access for all visitors. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, my second question is with I just want for clarification purposes, the private facilities are in addition to the NHS facilities. Am I right? Yes, we're about to do um, private work with irreducible spare capacity. So at the weekends, evenings, you can do that. Um, but they don't detract from the NHS facilities. They are absolutely on top of the 24 rooms I talked about. So for example, where you've got 38 patient beds uh, and then you've got plus 10 patient beds for private, making yes, 48, okay. Yes, that's correct. And it's probably worth adding that when we have a lot of inpatients on all of our sites, we use our private patient wards flexibly. So, for example, the private patient wing in Primley Park has been used almost exclusively for COVID patients for the last couple of years. So it, it's, it shouldn't be seen as a totally the, um, one or the other. We, we do use them flexibly. OK, and uh, just lastly, uh, staying with the private uh, facilities, I'm assuming there are no differences in, in terms of furniture, quality and order between the private patient facilities and the NHS facilities. I, I just invite you to come and see it for yourself. The feedback from our patients who've been in the wing already is, quote, this is like being in a hotel, this is like being on a cruise ship. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, that's uh, okay. I'm, I don't want to be a patient, but yeah, that is good. It's good to hear. <laughs> Thank you. I think he's volunteering. Um, it's, I, I've seen it in a few other councillors, and I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, it's, it's it's brilliant. Um, Councillor Jill Birch. Thank you, Chairman. I'm actually really really pleased with this as well i think it's a brilliant facility and actually i used it as an outpatient and had appointments and was treated superbly so um i can't fault what you've done what i was going to ask do you have any figures you know with this elected surgery um obviously it's to reduce waiting lists have you any figures about how your you know percentages or how you're going to reduce the waiting list say for knee surgery for hip surgery 
for orthopedics because I do know um, I've got well one friend recently that's just booked in privately to get her operation done and um, I think this is a real key area for our residents so do you have any figures? It, it's quite difficult to describe it as Carol has, has described because the way we've been changing the way we treat patients when the unit reaches full capacity our, our rough estimate is that it will give us about a nine percent increase in activity compared to the year before the pandemic which is the way and the NHS uses its bench line now that doesn't mean the trust can do that because I've talked about problems with the theatres at Frimley Park which we're having to but it, uh, when it when all other things are equal it's that order of magnitude of an increase okay thank you so of course Covid has produced a bigger backlog as well hasn't it is yes. that correct yes for nearly every hospital in the country Oh, oh, absolutely. It's national. It's, it's nothing to do with, you know, Frimley Trust. Um, but um, thank you for that. So you think about a 9%. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Jill, very much. Um, could I just go on um, top of that uh, a question? Um, obviously, the productivity was part of the new hospital. Um, is it actually operating Saturday and Sunday all the time, uh, Dan? Uh our plan is to open it on Saturdays, and that's what we're now doing. So it's, it's designed to run 50 weeks in the year, six days a week. And I think it's also worth mentioning that the previously the Frimley Park Hospital had what's called in the NHS an extended working day. So it, it ran its theatres 10, 10 hours a day. In, in most trusts, the, the sort of standard theatre day is, is, eight, is eight hours of activity. And as part of going live, we've introduced that 10-hour working day to Heatherwood and to Wexham Park. So we, we've tried to up our productivity and our activity levels across all of our sites. That's very, very good, I'm sure. Um, can I just ask also, I, I noticed that um, you're doing things like prostate there um, and uh, w with cancer and um, uh, uh, some eye, eye, I'm trying to think of the name of it now, um, uh, a laser, laser uh, for eyes. Cataract removed. Thank you, cataracts indeed. I've had it done too. Um, is the idea to bring this across different hospitals? Because uh, obviously, um, you know, in Windsor there tend to be the eye hospital. Um, is the sort of pattern that you're trying to just relieve the pressure of these main centres? We're, we're trying to relieve the pressure. There, there's a there's a large see our backlog. As, a, as an organisation is different to the backlog in, in the wider economy because of course not every patient is referred to us but the, the specialties that are sort of most affected tend to be um, the big five are orthopaedics, ophthalmology, gynaecology, urology and general surgery. They, they tend to be the ones that have increased their backlogs the most as a consequence of Covid nationally, regionally and, and locally. So we're trying to reflect that additional need through additional capacity and, and it, this will be on top of the provision that you talked about. Very good. Thank you very, very much. Can I, can I just come in as well? Sorry, yes, Chair. Go on, can Carol. I just add? Um, you mentioned about the um, the specialist eye hospital, King, um, and and just to, just to reassure everyone, that's still continuing. So so the the cataract and ophthalmology work that we'll be doing at Heatherwood is a hundred percent in addition to uh, the service that's already available in the north of the cap, north of the patch there. Ophthalmologist, okay. yeah, no, and it's a great. A great facility, that one too. Um, could I just ask one last question uh, before we move on? Um, in prostate, um, did I see in the news that blood samples now you can you can decide a about a problem much easier than you could previously? Or did I make that up? Um, I suspect that you're not making it up, but I'm not a clinician, and I think I'd be unwise to to, okay. um, to, to, to comment. What I, what I would say is that the prostate pathway is, is designed to diagnose prostate cancer as quickly as possible. The treatment would, would still be done on the, on the Frimley Park site um, right. as, it, as it already is. But, it, but it's really important that that one stop can significantly speed up. And of course, with all the advantage of earlier diagnosis that you'd expect. Thank you very much. Um, well, unless there are any more questions and I can't see any on my screen. Oh, I'm so sorry, there is. Michael. <laughs> yeah. oh, very quickly, if I, if I can, on that. Um, I noticed that there's a GP hub uh, pod 
within a standalone facility. Will the, will the residents have to register there as a doctor or is it a drop-in centre? And if that is the case, that there is a medical need urgently, will the doctor then be able to transfer the person over to Heatherwood for treatment or will they have to make another booking? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. So it's two existing ASCAP practices that have moved into a more modern facility. So in terms of registration, they would follow their normal procedures in terms of remaining registered with, with that practice or those practices which have moved over. In terms of urgent treatment, um, again, Heatherwood is not, a, is not an urgent treatment. So if we're talking about within days, then we would see if we could find a place to squeeze them in. But if it's a treatment that needs to be doing within hours, we would follow the normal protocols as the practices in Ascot do now, and patients would be referred to Wexham or Frimley um, in the same way as they already do. Just to, uh, to, to add to that, to Michael's point, um, presumably on the new two GPs, uh, Green Meadow and uh, Ascot Medical, isn't it? Two, two, two. Um, if they do have something that needs looking at, like an X-ray quickly, is it easier now to just whip across to Heatherwood and, and, and get that done? Um, we can do that in, in most circumstances. Um, and it's probably a question about travel time rather than saying it's yeah, the process will be the same. It's about shorter distance between there and the hospital. But don't forget, there are also um, walk-in x-ray facilities at Bramps Bridge. Mm. There are facilities at St Mark's. King Edward. So I, I wouldn't want people to think it's the, yeah. only, it's the only game in town. There are, there are lots of places we can make this happen. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for everyone, and th thanks to you, Dan, and to Carol, and um, congratulations on a fantastic facility, and, you know, I'm sure that we'll, uh, well, will we be there? I hope probably we won't, but uh, anyway, I look forward to that, and I would like to say just one thing, because and Sir Andrew Morris, um, uh, you know, I think some credit goes to him, because he pushed this through uh, over some time, and I think we need to say thank you to him, too, so... Um, thank you very much, and thanks for your input tonight. Kirsty, did you want to say something? Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, yes, of course, Jan. Uh, I, I noticed that Councillor Templeton um, has joined us since I did the attendance hall, and so Councillor Templeton, if you wouldn't mind um, just turning your microphone on and confirming that you are with us. Yes, I'm very happy to be with you now. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mary. Um, okay, we'll now go on, please, on our agendas to item number seven. Um, and um, my pleasure to work uh, to welcome um, uh, Tim Whedon, who's our chief executive. Um, and I must say, Tim, um, congratulations to the team because, you know, we're sitting here in a, what seems like NASA, actually, um, it's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. And uh, so thank you very much to all that and for your team for pushing this through. It's brilliant. Um, would you like to take us through this, Tim? Sure. And, uh, thank you very much. And I think it's more the team than me that's made this possible. Um, but uh, this is a, a first for me with uh, members in a very familiar council chamber and me in what now I think is probably a very familiar study, but um, it's uh, um, in terms of the, the CPOR, uh, the report refers to the, the third quarter of the year, so the period October to December last year. As you can see from the, the raw statistics, uh, in terms of progress against service plans, it was uh, pretty good. 90% of the actions were, uh, were green. Uh, and in terms of the key indicators that we measure, then 86% uh, of those were, were, were green. So uh, that represents reasonable performance, I think. Um, the quarter was, it, looking back at it, it feels very different to, or now feels very different to what we were experiencing during the period, October to, no, uh, to December. So. This was the period where there was the surge in uh, Delta cases that was beginning to uh, increase the, um, the, the incidence of um, coronavirus again, uh, which was then followed by the Omicron variant. So the government nationally moved from plan A back to plan B. So we'd begun to move back into the office uh, and we had to return to home working and readjust to that. Uh, intense support 
um, or in in intense pressure on our adult social care services uh, as we experience the the, the 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 end of the sequence on uh, the hospitalisation process. Um, there was uh, in significant support given to schools through the period. Yet whilst that was happening, we were also preparing the budget for the current year. Uh, members were involved in that through the quarter. We had the local government peer review came uh, in November. And members would have seen the report that that, that they produced now, um, and that identified a council that knows what it's doing largely and uh, uh, is far from perfect, but which actually generally delivers um, on the uh, the areas that, um, that, that that people think are important. Uh, we submitted the local plan. And those of you that are in Times Square tonight will have probably seen the new collaboration space that we've uh, um, was was uh, finished during that quarter. As I say, not everything's perfect. But also, there was a new experience for us in that we received the uh, Ofsted report of special education needs uh, and disability services, which was not what we aspire to. Uh, and members will know that we're producing a, a detailed action plan that we'll be uh, submitting back to Ofsted in early June, uh, and which will be going through the uh, executive in uh, in May before that. But uh, but taken in the round, um, I think it was a largely successful qu um, quarter for the vast majority of our services. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, could I just fire out one question? Um, I noticed that on the report, Tim, um, you said that the 1.75% um, pay increase haven't quite been accepted by the unions. How, do, do you see that as a real problem? Uh, it was subsequently um, agreed, and we um, think it was... Um, and it, it's a national agreement, and it was... Um, I think the back end of February, and, and it was paid in in March. Good. So we can tick that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I just wondered also um, if you could give us some thoughts about the deck um, and where we are with that, because we're all keen to see that happen. Are we are we closer to that? Um, every day we're closer to it. <laughs> Is that the answer? No, you know yes. more than that, Tim. You know more than that. Yeah, but the, the, the deck is a subject of confidential discussions between the uh, Practical Regeneration Partnership and me, and, and uh, an overview and scrutiny commission was not the right place for me to tell you what's happening. But you think, it, you think that there's positive news soon, do you? I have to give us some I hope. Do. Okay, that's good. Um, any members would like to, um, to, to raise a question? Uh, Councillor Birch, Jill Birch. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I've got a couple of questions, if I may. Page 55, um, uh, children's social care. There's a lovely graph there. And um, the best case scenario of overspend and the worst case scenario are very close together. So does that mean we're actually about four, nearly four million um, going to spend over? Um, so overall, the council will... Um, will meet its budget or has met its budget because of course we're into the next year uh, now the fact that the two were converging the worst case and the best case gives you a pretty clear indication of where children's social care would have been at the, at the end of the year but taken in the round that doesn't mean that that doesn't include the application of any contingencies to support some of the areas in children's social care that we always knew were likely to come through higher as well Oh, thank you. So does this include the high needs block as well? No, the high needs block is outside of the uh, the, 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 the budget and is, is under, underwritten by central government. OK, thank you very much. Um, I was actually interested just in the levelling up funding uh, was not successful for the deck, and you've answered um, the query that it's still on track, so that's fine. Um, I was also going to page 60 about the NEAT numbers. Um, you know, that they've obviously, you know, it's amber, 
because we know that that's gone up for lots of reasons, mm -hmm. COVID being one of them. Mm -hmm. But I was going to ask you, um, what are we doing to to alleviate this? We are we going to recruit a new post-16 position? Are we going to do something actively about this now? Well, the fact the fact that it's in the it's one of the things that we track through the service plan, and yeah. the fact that it's amber means that we will be trying to do something. If you uh, if you would like a, a detailed explanation on that, then I'm happy to give it to you subsequently, and uh, that's the reason why we ask for the detailed questions in advance. I take that and I would like um, something about that, please. Thank you very much indeed. And the last comment I've got is page 64 is about the complaints. Um, I think it was page 64. Um, I understand that obviously for various reasons that's been quite high, but is it just is it going down now? Uh, are we dealing with this? Um, we are dealing with it. There are two or three areas within the council where we are under real pressure uh, in terms of our ability to uh, recruit um, and um, the so the the areas where we get the most uh, complaints are clearly there's been issues around special education needs which I've mentioned um, the number of complaints on that has begun to fall but there are, there are still issues that need to be resolved. Um, planning is an area where we're under real pressure because it's just it's very difficult to recruit staff. Uh, and so, I mean, the numbers for most councils are quite small. I mean, you know, I know it's important that we get the, the context of this right, but for Bracknell Forest historically are higher. And the, the third area is, is revenues where um, we've had the um, uh, all of the all of the grants that were had to be paid out to uh, people who are self isolating to businesses, and now we've got the uh, uh, thirty six thousand payments to be made to people who are in band eight D properties to uh, um, to to, to uh, offset some of their increased uh, um, energy costs as well. So with that kind of pressure coming on the service, I think literally with uh, 12 hours notice from, from, from government, then that's an area where obviously there's, you know, we're a little bit behind where we would have wanted to be. Mm, thank you for that. I do appreciate it. And of course, COVID has had a massive impact on staff and I do appreciate that. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you, you, Chairman. Thank you, Jill, very much. Um, Tim, can I just ask, going back to Jill's point about the planning, um, is this, a problem throughout local governments of, of, of getting planning assistance um, and there's no easy fix to this. Is it that there's a shortage or is it just that people don't see this as a, a career path? Oh no, there are, there, 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 there are plenty of qualified planners. Um, the, uh, the, the market's cyclical really, that as the, uh, um, as the uh, economy or the building industry begins to pick up, then developers employ more planners and they tend to pay more than uh, local authorities do. Yeah. So again, it's you know uh, uh, private versus public, and you know, that's, that's, that's a uh, it's always going to be a bit of a, a race. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I don't think there's all oh, there is. Um, Michael. Um, thank you. Uh, Good evening, Tim. Uh, oh. My understanding with regards to the collaboration space was that uh, we were going to have offices where people can rent and we had tenants. Uh, what is the occupancy rate now that we finished the work? Okay, well, that was never going to be part of the collaboration space. The collaboration space was designed to be exactly as you see it today. Um, we have, as we've downsized, then we've got one half of one floor that is, uh, that, that's not being used at the moment, and we've not let that, as you know. Okay, uh, thank you. I mean, that space, uh, we talked about, and I can recall, we talked about uh, sort of the charity sector and volunteering sector using that space. Is this, I mean, can that still happen? Well, 
the the voluntary sector are very welcome to um, use the, uh, the the area on floor one uh, on the ground floor. Sorry, the the, the meeting suites which you're in part of uh, today and will be doing uh, from uh, from from this week. Um, the rest of the the, the voluntary sector is about what they need and whether the, the accommodation that we've got is what they want to move into and also what leases they already have. Um, so, you know, there are some some organisations that I think we would quite welcome into the building and who I understand would be interested in coming into the building. But if they've got a lease in another premises for another two years or, or whatever it might be, then it's not going to happen just yet. OK, thank you. Uh, on page 70, uh, what do you consider long-term sickness, understaffed uh, sickness? I think it's defined as greater than six weeks, actually, but... Um, six weeks, okay. And the long-term sickness uh, under this uh, various sub uh we also uh, have COVID. Uh, is that in addition to the long-term sickness? or is just part of the long-term sickness? Um, it would be part of, Okay. but it's not a large part of. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I can't see any other members that want to ask any questions. Uh, Tim, the, um, the cafe area down on the ground floor, I, I think is absolutely brilliant. I have to say, I, I think they've done a great kind of, it's a great space, actually, um, and people can use it. And I think this will encourage people to come back here and, and use, the, use the council offices again. And um, I, for one, uh, I'm sure members do want people back, um, you know, carry on the good work, but do it here in, the, in Times Square. So if you're happy with that, Tim. Well, I mean, we, we have a, an agile working policy and we expect, on average, people to be in between one and two days a week. But there are some roles that, uh, that require people to be in the office more than that. Some roles require them to be in the office less than that. Yeah. Um, but certainly, like just about every other organisation in the country, we won't be back to a position in the foreseeable future, in fact, probably ever where we've got um, 800 desks being occupied in, in, in Times Square. That's just not the way the world works anymore. No, but I, I'm sure you would agree that, um, that the, the place, like anywhere in, in the world, commercially or public, uh, works on kind of people working together, and that uh, gives it great kind of energy. Which uh, And that's one of the reasons for creating the collaboration space, yes, yeah, absolutely. And it works. Okay, Tim, thank you very much, uh, indeed. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Um, and thanks for your help. So, um, you. members, we'll go on now, please, uh, to something that's really important. We've talked about this a long time, actually, um, and that's mental health. Um, and um, I know Councillor Gibson's done a report, which we're going to look at. Um, before we go to uh, to Mike, uh, uh, Kevin, did you want to lead in to this um, before we go to Councillor Gibson, or, or or do you want me just to hand it over? Chair, I, I, as Action Scrutiny Officer, I haven't got anything to add to the report, so I think uh, uh, Councillor Gibson could uh, just take us through that, I think. Mike. Thank you, Chair. Um, first slide up, right. This uh, is the Health and Care Overview Scrutiny Panel Review of Mental Health. Um, to be a little more precise, we looked at uh, primary care, uh, access to primary care uh, and voluntary sector uh, provision. Um, it was uh, born out of the uh, impact of COVID. So why did we do it? Um, there was a concern from partners that there had been uh, an impact of COVID. We were seeing a lot of stuff in the news. If you put yourself back into that uh, place a year ago, um, there was a lot of fear and disruption going on in various services. Um, Health Watch had uh, carried out a survey where um, this was one of the uh, very important to residents 
issues uh, was mental health provision. Um, so uh, we were aware there was some increase or a presumed increase in uptake. So bearing in mind that we focused on um, self-help early intervention, um, that was why the, uh, uh, the uh, review was brought about. Next slide, please. So, um, as you can see, self-help, early intervention, looking at primary care and voluntary sector prison for adults. Uh, we went through and looked at what our partners were doing in the NHS, how it affected them, um, what was happening in the voluntary sector. Um, we went to residents who had actually had experience of going through the mental health um, services at the time, and of course what we were uh, providing within Bracknell Forest itself. So we've had a number of conversations, and thank you for the forbearance of the panel for quite as many meetings as that uh, we went forward to. Um, we did briefly look at um, access to, to GPs because this is where referrals come from, but it wasn't the main focus of the uh, review um, because there was a, a, an access project being carried out by uh, Bracknell Health Watch at the time. Next slide, please. So the service and access, um, there's a right, wide range of professionals that can refer, um, not only GPs, but social prescribers, primary care link workers, community nurses. Um, and most early intervention services accept self-referrals. Uh, the issues that we found with people were looking under this uh, large variety of services which were available uh, were things like the public not knowing that the service exists, uh, uncertainty about what the services are and what it does, uh, and, and a certain confusion about what um, what might be a wrong way or a right way to access help. So um, we did find that there was increased uh, pressure on GP for mental services, um, uh, and of course with, with a reduced amount of GPs, but it was within the uh, um, targets that the NHS had. So it's a bit of a spoiler for the result, but next. Uh, so we're looking at the impact of the uh, pandemic. And while there was an initial decrease um, at the start of the pandemic, it was starting to get back to the levels um, of people were going in for, for things like low, anxiety, low level anxiety um, and depression, um, rather than the develop more severe and complex needs, which we weren't looking at. But the, uh, the, the one of the um, findings was that younger people were beginning to, uh, there was a larger range of younger people beginning to um, access services. Uh, and we thought with isolation it might have been older, but it was there was an increase in younger people, uh, which was interesting. And the fact that the blended models, people were starting to use um, internet and uh, hybrid models of, of access, um, meant there was a, a more varied way of people doing it rather than just just one to one, um, and this was was actually uh, helpful. And uh, talking therapies, which is the main uh, source of uh, therapy, um, uh, noted that there was an improved um, uh, uh, attendance and recovery rates because of this. So uh, this helped um, relieve the pressure on uh, GPs. The the one of the things, and this won't surprise. Uh, the panel was that the uh, voluntary sector have still not come quite to terms with um, how much impact it has had on them and they are carrying out reviews. We've spoken to, to Involve about this um, and they will be updating us But um, as, as they carry out their reviews, uh, especially things like long COVID, which people aren't particularly um, aware of how much impact that would have um, on that. Can we go on to hard to reach communities? The panel noted that all the different groups that we were talking to in the voluntary sector had said that they felt that there was a low uptake from culturally and ethnically diverse communities and were working to how they would increase that um, mix. And that's something that we would like to revisit when we go back to looking at this uh, again. But it was a, a common factor across that um, people were interested in uh, the, the 
different organisations uh, said that this was an important factor that they were trying to change because of because of the situation of COVID. And that's borne out in one of our recommendations, which I'll come to later. Health and wellbeing strategy. While we were carrying out our uh, snapshot look at um, uh, access to mental health provision, um, the wellbeing strategy uh, and Bracknell Forest Health, the draft health and wellbeing strategy was out for consultation and, and the review. So we've noted that we've sort of been going in the same direction with our findings and some of our recommendations um, align with uh, the, what the panel's looking at. Um, and so when I get to the recommendations, you'll see how that's um, been tied together and hopefully added value to what we're doing there. Relationships and collaborations. Um, very pleased to find out that actually the different groups were working very well together. Uh, it was noticeable when we were going through um, talking to different groups, how they were referring to other organisations. Um, and you'd think this provides a strong base to support continuous improvement in mental health services. Um, CCG partners commented that this collaborative approach in identifying improvements works well. And we did hear strong um, evidence uh, of collaboration across partners on a number of the topics that we looked at while we were interviewing people. Good practice. Two of the key things that um, came out of um, our review was that we were very keen to see, and the service user spoke about being uh, worked with rather than just um, told um, what to do or how to do it. It, it was this um, direction of care and recovery with people and the examples of um, uh, users, uh, how they co-design their care. And this is also reflected in the Frimley ICS strategy 2019 to 2025. Um, and lastly, before I get on to the uh, recommendations, that if you look at the... Uh, uh, recovery rate, the target's 50%. We've got it in East Berkshire, 58%. Reliable improvement, target's 64 with 68. Treated within six weeks of uh, referral, 75% um, is, is the target. It's 98% in East Berkshire. And with, and treated within 18 weeks of referral, 95%. So this is, this is for the period we looked at it. Um, uh, and that was sort of uh, October, no, over the last year. But uh, it does show that some of the fears that had initially triggered this were not um, valid with relation to what we were looking at. So I'm, I'm not talking about the wider area, just what, the, um, what we looked at as a panel. So to add value um, of finding out, yes, that they were succeeding, we've made a number of recommendations. Uh, and I have to say the collaboration with the other um, uh, organisations has meant that these have been... Uh, uh, well accepted. Um, what we were intending to do is to help people to understand what the service was to remove fear of the unknown. One of the recommendations, uh, including people with experience of the service, to act as ambassadors so to demystify what was um, actually uh, what people think of as mental health um, and how things like anxiety and other people have, have had that affected. So we are looking at developing a, a public facing marketing and communication campaign to raise awareness of the services and uh, how to access them. And this is in parallel, as I said earlier, with the uh, draft health and wellbeing strategy. Um, as I said, the importance of users to help relaunch an improved version of the community map. Um, we know that that's successful. It's a key point, key plank, and actually having the users involved in that um, is very important. Um, health and Wellbeing Board ensures that community map uh, um, not only is used uh, has users uh, input, but also that GPs and practice staff and the voluntary sector get information on it so that they can use what's in there um, uh, on the community map. Um, so that's a we know it's an aim of the Wellbeing Board, but we wanted to re-emphasise that actually taking uh, taking that on board and crossing it through GPs and practice staff would actually enable its use. Um, and we want to uh, 
a relaunch of um, having a public meeting. Now, there they used to be these before um, uh, COVID hit. So we're probably looking at the end of this year. Um, so we can engage with the public to help me explain services, make connections. Uh, and um, I, I think that's something that we're looking at uh, going on to at the end of end of uh, this year. So next, uh, these two are actually being made to the executive uh, in on the seventh of June, um, and we've spoken to the exec member uh, for adult social services, uh, um, and hopefully that will. Uh, to raise the, the way to hang on, I'll just need to swatch. Right, so this is to reinforce looking um, uh, uh, to present the, health, the mental health review report to health on the seventh of June, and that um, I've been in, uh, I will be invited to actually present uh, a further report to them um, on what we've done here. Uh, and that we uh, we were referring to the community spaces uh, earlier when we were talking to Tim, uh, actually using them to uh, by mental health groups, and that's one of the strands of uh, using the community spaces yeah. to do that. Uh, so that's those are the two recommendations to the executive, and finally to um, Primary Clinical Commissioning. Um, we're looking at improving websites for uh, for access. Uh, we've spoken to and they agree this is something that we can all consult on, um, on how that best looks. They haven't given us a target date yet, but we hope to have that at some point. We didn't want to tie them down because they're actually carrying out their review of all their websites, but that's a two-year project. We want this to be actually brought into a, uh, as specifically to mental health, on a shorter term than that. Um, and again, the talking therapies, there's work going on at uh, Primary CCG, um, on uh, the findings of what talking therapies are doing. So, uh, especially with the culturally uh, and ethnically diverse communities and older people, and they've agreed that they will share that information. We're not exactly sure what format it'll be, and that's to be confirmed by the um, Premier CCG. So, those are the eight recommendations which I recommend to you. Any questions? I will do my best to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Um, comprehensive go through that. Uh, so, would any any member like to 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 ask uh, ask a question, please? Well, I'll dive in. Um, <laughs> that's oh, there is someone. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, I noticed, Mike, about uh, the di um, how can I put this non-white section um, of of our community. Um, um, that there was a very low take-up. Uh, I think you mentioned this in the report. I'm just wondering how, you know, how you get to people of uh, different um, cultural backgrounds. Good question. The one of the ways that we've suggested, because um, I did refer to, we were going through users' journeys through mental health, is actually looking at people that are from different ethnic um, and cultural backgrounds and uh, using them as reaching into their own communities. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been volunteers through, uh, I think, stepping stones from people that are recovering through that they would use people from that area to demystify and go into it. So that was one of the ways of going forward. Also, um, I think one of the things that we'd like to see is, is um, councillors, community leaders being... Uh, made more aware of what's available during induction and that would um, help with these communities um, on how we would go into them. But those are the sort of two aspects of how it was, uh, how it was working. So, um, and we got that from a number of the groups. Do you think, um, you know, uh, on Facebook, um, where councillors could have Facebook um, going forward, that would help? Um, on, on you know where people look at Facebook more than perhaps uh, things through the door. Or the the aspect of social media um, and how that helps um, is a tricky one because Facebook is usually now used by people um, average uses of forty five and over. Um, I'm not saying that's a uh, and you know there's there's more use of Instagram by 
younger people and how you turn that into a mental health thing is, uh, is, is a tricky question. I think the marketing strategy that we refer to as one of the recommendations, I think it's recommendation uh, one, would encompass looking at social media as uh, a possible uh, route of, um, of how we access um, uh, hard to reach uh, communities. Sometimes you can team up with uh, branded uh, organisations that aren't totally associated with, say, the council. So s people might be suspicious of the council as a, as a, a, as a hierarchical organisation they hear about with tax and go to, say, CAB. So we want to the CAB, which is not tied into looking at anyone else, although we do support them, and try and see um, how they could use some of their operatives to help in the hard to reach areas. So there's a number of strategies which um, would go forward to the to um, the marketing of, of that. And I think the chief one we're doing, of course, is the um, is the fair, if you like, that referred to that we hope to go for sometime in the latter quarter of the year. But what we will be keen on doing is when we go back to revisit on this, is to see how much effect um, these strategies had on increasing uptake uh, in, in the communities. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, I think uh, th this work has been long overdue and as very, very important. And I think you picked the right timing as well. Thank you. Uh, from everything that we've learned from COVID. Uh, the recommendations are sound. I would like and you to consider also as part of the marketing strategy how we approach and engage with businesses uh, because a lot of people probably stressed out and all that tend to go to work and so businesses will have a, a probably a, a better insight into the well-being and the mental health of their staff so how do we extend that marketing and sort of a, a communication campaign, raising awareness with those people, the organization. Can I just say blast? That's a really good idea. I've missed that. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for that suggestion. It's a really, really good one because for initial access through promoting, through it, that's a really good idea. And I think we should look to um, seeing what we can include in marketing strategy to reflect that. That's... That's a really good idea. You might think about that in the recommendation, maybe. Um, well, it, it, it's in the recommendation, uh, as Michael has said, as, as Councillor Badbo has said, mm. because it's part of that strategy. But it needs to be part of that strategy that goes forward. I can, I can all, it, that's actually ticked a couple of things in my head, um, because that will provide, depending on what the businesses are, that could also help to reach hard to reach businesses as well. So I would definitely take that away. Um, and um, make that as part of the underlying the underlying approach because that is a really good idea. Okay, and just lastly, if you if you if we're thinking about reaching this sort of add to reach uh, section of our society, uh, I would just like to offer that a lot of people do confide in their religious leaders and community leaders and, and stuff like that. So they will not necessarily use, yeah. you know, services like this. So that although they might be going through, uh, so I think we probably, as part of this, need to focus on educating those people that are likely to end up being the years. You know, so it's how we engage with the community leaders and the religious leaders and stuff like that to ensure that if worst case scenario, they can signpost people. Yeah, that, that is them. actually part of the strategy yeah. there, looking at reducing oh, leaders because that, as you say, uh, religious leaders is one of the main way of actually accessing and being able to pass on that information. Um, so that is taken as part of what we would do under that, that strategy. So that's, that's, thank you. Yeah, no, I just lastly again, thank you for doing this work. I think it's very important. And I think uh, part of your recommendation that we have a review yeah. afterwards, uh, if it'll next at the end of the year, yeah. I think it's also very important. It's a good way of following up. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Jill Birch, Councillor Jill Birch. Um, thank you, Chair. I actually um, was fortunate to take part in, in this review. And I think it is timely. 
and it one of the real key features is it raises awareness of mm. mental health i know we've all been more aware of it during covid but it is a really high of high importance i think it's really been proven um i also think that has links with what i'm doing at the moment because of children's mental health and um, we're looking at special needs and i think that the the links there have been very good I actually commend the recommendations. I particularly like um, to relaunch the community map with um, with a, an event or a fair so that everybody can get together. I think that is excellent. And I think it really highlights how we need to reach out. I liked um, the number three because it's training. It is talking about education. It is making sure that people are aware of what's out there. And I really hope everybody takes on board these recommendations because I think they're really key for the well-being of our residents and um, raising the profile. So thank you very much for this for this review. And um, I really enjoy taking part. Um, and I think it's really excellent. So thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. Michael. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, in some ways, my question follows on from the question, uh, Chairman, that you asked about BAME. And I'm thinking specifically about the engagement of the doctors when those people who come from Afghanistan and more recently from UK, Ukraine are actually going to be registered with the doctors. And I think they will be picking up, and it's something that is in the report as a recommendation, picking up, uh, I think, for those children, uh, adults, single people who've come through a trauma, and I think are statistically are probably more likely to have mental health issues that are underlying, that I hope the GPs will have time to identify, capture, and take forward and engage with the voluntary sector in such a way that they can give them support. Maybe not physical support in the form of medication, but I think moral support. Thank you, Chairman. Michael, do you want to pick that up? Um, yes, I, I mean, it, it's something that's been mentioned, but, but they are being provided with that support. It's probably more than what the primary um, uh, care that we're providing, so it didn't really come within the remit. But that's not to say how important that is. But I believe um, that social services are already, uh, and our partners are already taking that into account. But you're right to highlight it because it is an important issue. I think also, if I've got this right, the government are going to give some money to councils uh, to help... Um, you know, in, in that kind of area, mental health and and and, and uh, general health matters. I think um, one of the points uh, um, I was interested in, Mike, was the Gellert's Hill because uh, Monty Don uh, has been on about this a long time. Because I know Monty had uh, his own problems, and um, you know, gardening um, is such a therapeutic, releasing. At, you know, at, at, at the, um, the, the cultural thing to do. And um, it's just interesting to see all these things together. So anyway, I just thought I'd make that point. Um. If, if I may um, sum up then, um, yeah. you pick at Genix Hill, um, that was my gem that I found through this. Uh, uh, I know Councillor Lizzie Gibson is, is already familiar with it, but I wasn't. And I'm looking forward to going to visit it after having the discussion. As you say, the gardening is very therapeutic um, and uh, that was a very inter interesting group to interview. I'm very keen on the preventative aspects of mental health. We look at um, if you can get them earlier, Jill referred to it, uh, in children's, the preventative is always the better. And I, I know that's a bit of a, an old saw, but I think it was very useful that we were actually uh, looking at those. I would just like to thank um, the panel for what was a fairly intensive um, amount of meetings that we had that was helped by being able to do it on, on um, a virtual basis rather than first face to face. Um, the uh, alacrity with which our partners wanted to join in and said how important it was um, that we were looking at these issues. Um, so we were very positive responses from everybody involved in providing it. And finally, if the clerk would uh, write down our thanks to the officer that was involved, um, which was Jen, um, because uh, it's my first time working on a major project um, in this council. 
uh, and I found the support excellent uh, and I look forward to doing the next one. A Thank you very much. A lady of many talents, actually. Uh, Mike, thank you very much and, and thanks to all the people I think that were on your team and all the people you saw um, during this very, very important report, uh, as we all know. Um, how would you like to play this? Would, shall we take the recommendations as a whole, um, if members were happy to do that, and see if there's any um, dissent? So can I just put that to everybody? Um, I think we can only vote here in the, in the chamber, but anyway, um, if anyone agrees that they, those recommendations we all approve, that nobody wants to say anything else, so, so there you go. So that's all approved. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much indeed. And thank, thank you very much, Mike, for that. Um, so I'll just move on, if I may, to um, item number nine, last one actually almost, um, which is the overview and scrutiny annual report. And I know um, uh, Council Angel, if he was here, has been working with, um, with the team uh, to gather all this um, together uh, and the, the report covers April 2021 to, to March 2022. Um, most of our work actually has been done, believe it or not, on teams. And so, you know, going forward, thank goodness we're back into the chamber. Um, I just wanted to say in the sense that um, the commission uh, and panels here in the work we do uh, is to act as a critical friend to this council. And, and we're here to, to, to look after the residents, but um, we've, we've covered in the commission things like the strategic health, um, as indeed tonight, um, and crime and disorder and budgets and others. Uh, and all those really are, are, are to, um, to ask challenging questions, which we all do as members, um, to make uh, our area, our residents, um, walk away with the best service we can possibly give to them. And the panel is obviously concentrated on education, health and, uh, and environment. Um, and this has played a vital role, uh, a vi a vital role uh, in the way we work. And just going back to some months away where we um, decided to really look at reviews um, akin to the programme the council is doing, um, I think tonight is, is a good example of, of, um, of things now that are very pertinent and, um, you know, we're having some real say in, in the way that things are, are, are done. So um, one other point that I think, uh, Mike, you mentioned, but I think other members have too, is that we will go back um, and maybe six months time or depending on, on what you feel, and we can then check on the recommendations that they've been properly uh, carried out and they are successful. Um, and if they're not, we can review them and, and uh, add, our, add our, uh, our, our two pennyworth. Um, the important thing is that overview and scrutiny has a very big role in this council. And, um, and I know that the three panel members and the deputies have played a very big part. So I'd like to thank them and I'd like to thank the teams and the members that have added to all these reviews. And I'd also like to thank the staff behind this, um, um, uh, Kirsty and her team. Um, uh, Jenna is not who's next to me at the moment, but you know, without them, we couldn't have done all this. So thank you very, very much. Uh, so I'd just like to therefore offer this report to members, and if you're happy, we'll carry this forward to the council meeting. Thank you very, very much. Okay, um, very last of all, just a bit of a roundup of where we are with things uh, and the work program. So we're looking at um, uh, item 10. Uh, Jill, do you want to just lead in a few words uh, uh, what you're doing, please? Uh, happy to do so, Chair. Um, we're actually currently doing the Special Education Needs and Disabilities, the SEND review. Um, it's due to be completed in July this year, 2022. Um, we've done quite a few um, visits to schools for their special education units. Um, we've had interviews with head teachers and with SENCOs. Um, panel has interviewed the executive member. 
senior council officers and senior health partners from, from ECCG. And we're just waiting for some extra data that we've asked for. And we plan to meet with senior partners from Berkshire Healthcare Foundation Trust. And then we'll be able to move to recommendations. Um, we're hoping for, for the meeting with the, the Berkshire Health Foundation Trust at the end of April, early of, of May, and that's got to be confirmed at the moment. We haven't got an actual meeting in the diary, but um, we've really had lots of parent carers who have given four, have given uh, reports. We've done secret shopping. So we've been secret shopping people. So um, anonymously um, interrogating the website and ringing up um, social care, children's social care. So. We've done a lot of research and um, I think we're just about there. So I'm sure that this will be on time in July. OK, thank you, Joe. And, and that, again, is a very important report to get. And I know it goes over different um, panels, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a cru crucial report at this point. I've got to say, Chair, that some of the evidence we've gathered is, is quite emotive and has been quite difficult to hear some of the things that are going on. I think that some of the recommendations may be quite hard hitting. Very good. So, okay. Um, so um, I'm just giving you a heads up on that. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing that report uh, in, in due course. Um, Thank you. Council Councillor Porter, um, come in and help us with your area, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the review at the moment is looking at integrated enforcement. Uh, we've had five panel meetings. Uh, we've had uh, interviews with the executive members, senior accounts officers, um, officers from Thames Valley Police. Uh, and our last one was with the Royal Berkshire Fire Rescue Service, um, as well as a uh, assistant director from the Royal Borough of Greenwich who have actually done integrated enforcement. So we were just trying to pick some of their things that they've been doing. Uh, actually, it looks like what they're doing is some of it we've already got in place. So, uh, but it was very interesting. Uh, we're now coming up to our sixth one, which is going to be looking at the recommendations. So we're on track. Uh, and it, it's very, you know, it, it's very informative. Um, but uh, it looks like our enforcement is already very well uh, administered by this council has a very good re working relationship with other councils and the uh, um, emergency services so uh, yeah it's um, very good news okay, I, you know far bit for me to be controversial um, but, <laughs> but I noticed in the Bracknell news there was some criticism that we didn't um, uh, prosecute some uh, fly tipping and things. I don't know. Uh, if you we we, we uh, at the public protection partnership. They've actually recruited one officer, an ex policeman, uh, that just deals with looking into fly tipping. So um, I think the fly tipping is well on the radar now, uh, and it's been very very successful. There's more CCTV being put in place in the hot spots. I'm sure Councillor Brossard will back me up on that uh, as Vice Chair of the uh, Licence and Safety Commission uh, Committee. Sorry. Um, so, you know, it is work in progress. We never used to have a dedicated officer, but now we have one. And obviously by recruiting an ex-policeman, uh, he has the detective instincts to go hunting for things that other officers wouldn't have done. No Good. disrespect to officers, but, you know, it, 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 there is a different... Um, it's skills. a different mindset, Sk isn't it? Different skills, yeah. skill sets involved, yeah. yeah. Very good. That's great news, actually, uh, for those uh, people who are going to do it. Michael, sorry. sorry. Can I just say, Chair, oh. it's actually bad news for the fly tippers. Yeah. In, fact, in some ways, Chairman, following on from what Councillor Porter had said, the residents themselves don't sometimes help in that they allow unlicensed trade waste collectors to collect material, cash in hand, and then don't ask the questions, where is it going? Can I see your trade license? And I'm very pleased that now, apparently not only will the fly tipper be prosecuted, but also the person who engaged with the fly tipper 
as aiding and abetting. And I think that is important that the public understand that they need to be vigilant. They themselves, through the council tax, may well be subsidising the cost of cleaning up the fly tipping by not being vigilant and asking appropriate questions of the person who knocks on the door and says, cash in hand. Yeah, here, here. I absolutely agree with that because uh, people take a quick option and it may not be um, a good for the community. Kevin, did you want to say something? I noticed you. Yeah. Yeah, yes, Jeff. I, I think that uh, that Bracknell News report was about Wokenham rather than Bracknell Forest. Um, so I recognise the story, but I'm not sure it was us. OK. OK. I accept that. <laughs> sure. um, right. So uh, yes, sorry, Michael. Can I just have a follow up on that? I think it's, it will be very uh, helpful if residents are aware of what to ask for. Because if I, if, if I wanted a service like that, I would just put something on Facebook. And if somebody came along with a van, I would just engage with them. I would never have known that you needed to check a license. You see, and I think, you know, so if the public are not aware of what to look for, it's very difficult to go back to them and blame them because they just act on trust. John. Th yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Councillor Gallivo. Um, the Public Protection Partnerships website is a, a very great place to go to. Uh, and I know people don't go to it, but there should be a link from the Bracknell Forest one. Um, and uh, the old say saying is that you never get anything for nothing. So people need to be very careful of who they employ when they are requesting uh, for their uh, household wastage to be disposed of. Uh, and a waste carriers license has always been one of the primary things you should always ask for. And they have been in place for many years. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. A lot of people I, kn I know people, people don't know, some people claim they don't know but they do know um, but it, we, 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 it might be one of our recommendations so watch this space Michael it's, it's really interesting a subject because people get so angry when they see these uh, dumped stuff and uh, um, okay um, Michael it's all down to you um, well as you've heard this evening, we have uh, completed the uh, mental health review. We are taking it to uh, the executive and we will also be hopefully taking it to um, the uh, health and uh, wellbeing board. Uh, and we are currently looking at our next proposals for what our work will be. Okay, Sweet. thank you very much. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks to the members. Thanks for everyone who took part this evening. Um, and um, I wish you a farewell. And the next meeting is on the 12th of May. Thank you very much and a very good evening to you all. Uh, good night.